Okay, I have some people joining here. Um, can somebody raise your hand or shout out if you can hear me and see the desktop here? Uh, let me get my chats up too, or you can go on the chat. Never remember where that is. Uh, oh, there it is. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Uh, well, somebody said they can see. All right. Um, well, only two, but I'm going to get started. Um, so, as usual, this is meant to be more of a help session kind of thing. So, you know, um, uh, shout out or type out questions at any point. Um, I'll try and answer them. So my agenda is probably to go over the assignment two or, and or maybe the quiz two. So quiz two is due in a few uh, hours here. If you haven't finished that yet, you need to do that. Um, but of course, assignment two is due on Friday, as everybody should know, for our week two here. Um, let me go kind of look at the um, announcements. Some of the stuff I talked about on Monday. Um, so you should do a Git poll if you haven't done that yet to get your build environment updated. Um, and yeah, the other thing, I mean, you know, the quizzes. So again, um, the, the quizzes are, are meant, their purpose is to be kind of a low pressure sort of thing. Um, you know, so they're not worth a whole lot of points overall for the, the course. So they're really meant to be a self-study kind of guide. So, you know, you're supposed to be reading the, the textbook materials and watching my lecture videos that I have posted for each unit. You should take the test on Wednesday, you know, and, and you shouldn't take it with other people and, and you shouldn't try it. You shouldn't be spending like lots of time looking stuff up in your textbook and stuff. You should just take the, 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 the quiz, or this is my intention, take, take the quiz um, with what you know, and then use the feedback you get to see, you know, do, do you feel comfortable that you kind of know the materials or not well enough? Um, and, and kind of, if not, uh, are there some things you ought to go back and look at, you know? So uh, kind of another announcement. Um, so we, we may be using some online proctoring things for, for our tests, which are worth a lot of points for this class. <coughs> which, excuse me, which can do a better job of detecting people that are working together on tests and things like that. So, you know, um, just be aware of that. So, so tests and quizzes are intended to be individual efforts. So from your own self-study, you're taking the quizzes um, and, and answering them and learning the materials and things. So, so and, and also make certain that you do review the quizzes. So I had a, a post on there. I'm getting some messages that my internet connection isn't very stable, so I hope that um, this comes through okay. So as usual, I am recording this. Um, usually the recordings are you know, a bit better than, than because it records my stuff locally here. So, but uh, hopefully it's not too bad for the people that are trying to participate here live. <laughs> So anyway, back to the quiz, um, you know, make certain that you do go back and review these. So if, if you don't know how to do that, if, if you if you go to like activities, quizzes, um, so this is an example of a test, but you should see like quiz, whatever, and then there should be a little arrow to pull down and, and under there should be an option to, to look at the submission review for your quiz. And, and then from there, you'll be able to find all the, um, correct answers. Um, I might sometimes give additional feedback. So, you know, so do review those. So yeah, th this week is all about structures and classes. So if you had questions about those, about the lecture materials, let me know. I'm planning on kind of going through assignment two here, getting started on it. 
in a bit, but in assignment two is really about writing a class and some methods for a class. So. Oh, by the way, I've, I found this, um, um, this has been popping up for uh, my videos when I'm posting my own videos for this class. Looks like some really good stuff. So if, if you're interested in becoming more um, sure about uh, getting more information about using the, the command line tools in the environment, uh, this is an MIT undergraduate course, but uh, they cover kind of some of the the same stuff, the, the bash command line and um, um, other things. So it looks like a really good, there's only like 10 or 11 videos, they're all like 40 minutes. So if you have some time, you might want to check those out, especially the first two. Uh, and then I think the fourth one, the third one is on using a VI editor, but um, the first two and then like the fourth one are like on the shell and, and like the, the, the Linux environment and, and stuff you can do with it. So. All right. So yeah, I'm going to start talking about stuff. Feel free to, to shout out a question or type in a question. I think I got my chat up here so I can see stuff. <coughs> and sorry, I don't have COVID, but I do have some uh, health coughing stuff. So, I'm, so I might be coughing here a bit today. Just allergies. All right. I'm going to bring up assignment two, start talking about that. So all the assignments should have the uh, assignment description as a PDF. Or I, I showed this on Monday, but you can also actually open up the markdowns. Um, so like if you go to Visual Studio, it has a markdown um, <coughs> viewer. So, so markdown is just a plain text format. It's a markup language like HTML or other markup languages. Um, so, uh, oh, but anyway, so um, the, but you can preview this. So, so you know, this is just markup with uh, different uh, things to mean things like level one headers and bullet points and you can do bold and, and things. And so sorry if you guys, because I did talk about these before, so we've already seen this. You can open up the preview though, so you can get the, the rendered version of the markup using your preview, and I think I'll bring that up instead of doing the PDF. Um, although I usually like my documents to have like a white background. I wonder if there's a way to change that. I won't look that up right now, but maybe in the future I'll, I'll change that up, so. Um, all right, so, but, but yeah, this might be useful because I, I returned back your assignment um, feedback uh, to you as a markdown document as well. So, so yeah, if you don't like looking at the plain text, you can always bring it up in like Visual Studio and, and get a, a better rendered version of it. So. All right. Um, assignment two is to write a class. So we're trying to write um, um, a set. We're trying to add, write, add a data type, a new data type to the class, okay? So as I talked about in my, my, my lecture videos for this week, um, the, the struct and the class um, in C++, like most languages, uh, allows you to add like your own user-defined data type. So our textbook um, that you're supposed to do readings from uh, talks about user-defined data types. So, so yeah, when, when you add like a, a class or when you define a class like the set, like we're doing here, it's as if you're adding a new type to the language. So, so now the, once you've had, you know, uh, created the set object, uh, then you can create variables of type set um, and then use those like you might use like regular variables, like integers and slopes and things, all right? So we get some examples of that in the testing um, file here. I think if I close that, yeah, it'll leave open my, my rendered markdown. Um, so let, let me open up the test and get my preview over here. And also we need the set.hpp file, and which is our header file, remember, and the set.cpp file, which is our implementation file. Don't forget to change your name and student ID 
um, and uh, check that. So I guess I got that correct for this class that uh, should, you should be using the same build environment, Visual Studio Code with uh, the GNU GCC tools and stuff. So. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, so I'll skip over the description. You ought to read that. Let's get right down to the tasks here. So, um, so like, like your first assignment, uh, in this assignment, we're gonna be, um, you're mostly gonna be writing functions, but you're gonna be writing uh, member functions for a class this time, right? So really the, the, the real work doesn't really begin till five. And uh, I'll give you one of these, uh, and that's probably all I'm gonna give you uh, on the video here, or for those of you that are uh, watching in real time or watch this maybe later on. So the, the, the first five are really just uh, creating some stub member functions, but, but let me talk about this. So, so like the first one says, start with a stub invitation of is empty. Um, um, and um, and uh, I guess maybe I should make this more explicit, but once you have your is empty function, um, you should be able to, to pass the first unit test case. So, so you should both uncomment the first unit test, which in this assignment is real simple. It just has one test, which checks that is empty is returning um, true, All right? Because by default, when you create a set, um, there's no way to create a set the way we've defined it to, to already came, contain some items. So sets initially will be empty. Okay? And, and notice that um, uh, here we're going to be reusing a set called S. Okay? So, but, but like I was saying, uh, creating a new class like we're doing here allows us to add a new data type to the language. So we're adding a set type to the language and you can create variables of type set. Like, so S is just a variable type set for this, this new data type we're adding to our, to the C++ language here, All right? So, um, of course, if you don't add the stub, um, this won't compile, but you should probably try that, you know, um, or we already see that there's a, a, um, a, an error here that the IntelliSense has given us that set has no member is empty because we haven't added the stub function for that yet, like I told you to do. Um, I'll go ahead and clean that just to make certain I might have been building before we came to this video here. Um, and build here. So it should give you, you know, an error right away that set has no member, right? Or it can even tell that before we compile. All right, so let's add the stub function, like I said, right? So in this case, if you return that that the um, true um, from is empty, um, it should be able to pass the test. Actually, let me go ahead and move these over to the other side here. So, so the way you add things, I mean, it's similar to like our first assignment. So you should always add the declarations or the definitions over in the header file. So in this case, we've got the, the, the definition of the set class, and here we're gonna have the prototypes for our member functions, right? So uh, we need to have the dec just the declarations, but not the actual implementations, okay? Uh, and like we did before, the implementations will go into the implementation file, which is set.cpp, right? And like I did before, again, this week, I've given you all of the header, uh, the, the, the function documentation. So you, but you do need to put the implementations for all of the, I think you've got like five or six functions you need to write in total here. Um, and they should become, you know, so that we start off with some simple member functions that just access some information about the set. Uh, and they'll get a little bit more complicated, the, the, the later functions, adding items and removing items from the set and so on. All right. But make certain you put the implementation in the correct place right after the, the documentation for the function, right? Uh, and, and again, you're just reading the documentation this week, but this should give you also information about what the signature is of the function that you need to write, right? So you should be able to use both the test um, and, and kind of what I write in the, in the documentation here. So, so here, the is empty doesn't take any parameters, so we don't have no parameters as input to is empty, um, but it does it does return a Boolean result, right? So it needs to return a Boolean. Right? So we can actually get the file to compile. Um, 
So you should, I mean, you know, I'd maybe try and follow my comments here. So, so I kind of wanted the, um, the accessor methods um, to go here. So that, that's the thing that just uh, returns information. Um, but, but, if, but methods like uh, get value or set something. So, so get size and set size are, are known as setters and getters. So th those would go here. And then your more complex methods like adding and removing items, you know, from, from there, right? But uh, yeah, again, so for the header file, you only have the prototype of the member function in this case. So that is, uh, we're working on is empty. So it has to match the name of the member function. It has to match the, uh, the signature of the member function. So the signature is no parameters as input, uh, returning the Boolean result, all right? So that will actually allow you to compile because again, the way includes work in C++ is since we're including set.hpp, now we've got the signature for the function that we're trying to use here, although the IntelliSense takes a while to realize it. Um, because now that we've declared that, you know, so, 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 so now it, it should see that, um, okay, somebody says we've got a function named is empty that's a member of the set class. So I should be able to call is empty on instances of a set like we're doing here and is empty doesn't take anything as input um, and it returns a boolean result all right so if i build uh, it should actually build even though we haven't implemented it yet but it won't link so it, it'll have a problem with trying to link this together uh, because it wanted and it, it, it'll be able to build the set.cpp file as well because nothing changed over there yet, so it'll rebuild that. But when it tries to link set.cpp together with the tests, it'll find there's no actual implementation of is it empty, um, and it'll, it'll choke at that point. So as usual, we'll have to wait for it to build. Uh, the, the unit tests are kind of slow to build on the, the catch framework, so. Um, still building here. Let's see if I can talk while this is building. What else could we take in? So, so you know, that's the general thing. And, and, you know, this general pattern that you've done last week and this week, okay, there were done building. So, you know, like I told you what happened um, uh, by just giving the function prototype, right, we're able to compile these files separately, fine. But when we go to link our executable, there's no is empty um, implementation anywhere. So the linker can't correctly link these together because I mean, we've got to provide that somewhere. All right. So let's go ahead and provide that. All right. So then the final thing to understand. So, so what I started saying that, so last week we were just building you were just creating regular functions. So there you, you put the function prototype in the header file and the actual implementation of the functions over in the implementation file, the .cpp file. So here now we're working with classes. So whenever you have an assignment where you have to do a class, you still have the same split. You, you put the declaration of the class here and, and inside of the class, you're gonna have the declaration, which is just the function prototype for all of your member functions, like we just did for is empty. And then you need to split the implementation. So you, you can put the implementation over here, but don't do that for this class. That's incorrect. So you do need to split these up. But when you have, for a class, when you have the implementation of a member function uh, in a separate file, in an implementation file, uh, you know, separately from where you declare it, you have to do something like this. So, so I mean, it has the, the, the signature, so, so like, like we did, like I showed before for assignment one, you could start by copying the signature. Uh, oops, did that wrong. So we can copy that, and paste it. And then, like I said, uh, I mean, the body should just be, to get started here, should just be a stub function. So we want to return true, all right? 
Um, and, and yeah, you don't have a semicolon after your actual implementation, you have curly braces with code in between. That's the implementation of, of a function in C and C++. Right? With one more thing though, so this isn't actually a member function, this is a regular function, okay? So if, if, if you need something to be, um, for the compiler to know that it's, a, it's supposed to be a member function of the set class, you have to add in this extra syntax. Like that. And now it's a function called is empty, but it's a member of the set class, set colon colon. All right. Again, if you have questions, the guys that are here interactively, shout them out. That should build now. Let's try it. You know, and again, never do more than what I showed you here, like add a line or two, you know. I mean, I guess the, the most is, is adding like a, a stub for your function, which is, is should only be like about four lines. To, to do that correctly, you have to get the, the signature right and, and just return something of the correct type for, for whatever the return is of the function that you're beginning to write. So, let's build that. Um, it ought to be relatively quick because it only has to rebuild set. It doesn't have to rebuild the tests and then link them together. But now we're good, right? Um, it was able to link. And so if you can understand kind of this output from building here, it, it successfully built. Um, and we got our test executable now. So now we can run our tests. Control Shift T is the keyboard binding I have set up, right? And yay, we're green. All tests pass, all right? So like I said, that's probably all I'm going to give you guys in, in the video here, right? So, but that's how you get started with a class, right? You add a, a, a member function, create a stub for it, make certain it compiles and builds. Um, and, and yeah, so, so if it compiles and builds, then we ought to be able to run the test, although it may or may not be passing the test, right? It passed the test here because we're expecting the set to be initially empty. So it should be true that is empty um, returns a true result uh, when, when, we, when we first create a set like S here. All right. So if you follow my instructions, two, three, and four are the same, but you need to get a stub that compiles and runs the test for get set size. Um, so get set size is an accessor method. So, so yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit then more about the set class, the way it's supposed to work here. So it makes certain everybody understands what they're supposed to be doing. Um, so this is an example of a setter getter method, actually, um, set and get accessor method. So, you know, um, I was kind of hinting that you ought to put that here. So get set size, the, the declaration of the function prototype should go here. And of course, you should get the implementation or your initially your stub should go here. Uh, actually, I got two string up, up, uh, before that. So yeah, again, make certain you put the implementations at the correct place where the where you find the function, the function documentation for it. So there's a, um, uh, actually, we're, we're supposed to be working on get size, right? So yeah, get size, um, get set size. So the name of it should be get set size. Or is that? There it is, get set size, should be there. Um, so anyway, you'll do get set size, um, you'll do contains item, um, which you can just initially have it just returning false. So, so yeah, if you do get set size and have it return zero, you should be able to pass this again to so the second unit test, um, uh, the second test case, I should say, again, only has one test. So um, um, if it returns zero, you'll pass that one. Um, the third test um, uh, checks whether it contains some items. But again, the set initially doesn't contain any items. So if you're returning uh, false, it'll actually pass all those, because uh, initially, it won't contain any of those items, 5390. So the correct answer is false. Um, and then you also need to, to uh, create a stub for string for, for uh, 
the, the string function, str, right? So the string function, again, you can just return, um, like, like if you just have a return statement, so I guess I am giving you more than one, but, but the, the, the return statement, if it just looks like that, just, just return a constant, a string constant with, uh, you know, a square brace, a space, and a, another square brace. And that's enough to get this test to pass. Um, if you do that as your, as your stub for the string function. Okay? And I'll talk more about the string function here. Um, but yeah, after that, the, the, the real work begins with task five. So I'll, I'll come back to that. But any questions? So let me say a word or two about the, the set class that you're supposed to be doing here. So, I mean, I know you were supposed to have at least done something with classes uh, in programming two. I know a lot of people, uh, you know, are, are pretty unfamiar with classes, with C++ classes when they come into this class, okay? So, um, here, you know, the, the, the set class has two member variables. So, so here, and they're both private, as I talked about in our video lectures for this week. So that's typical for a class. You want to encapsulate the data items for your class as private member variables, all right? So set size is just a regular integer. So that should keep track of the um, size of your set, all right? And initially, your size of the set should be zero. Okay. And in fact, so I gave you the constructor. So there is a constructor defined for this class. That was the only member function I gave you, right? And as we talked about in our videos for this week, constructors and destructors are kind of special class methods, but you can look at the implementation of the, the, the constructor for the set. So again, set, the, the constructor is a member of the set class. So it has set colon colon. But constructors and destructors don't have a return type, right? So this is not even a void function. So, so um, and if we had a destructor, it would look the same, except for the de destructor has a tilde in front to, to indicate it's the destructor for a class, right? We don't really need a destructor in this class, but you'll need that uh, as early as next week when we start working with dynamic memory allocation. So. So this is our constructor. No, it doesn't do anything to initialize the actual array of items, but it does set, make certain that the size of the set, the set size member variable is zero, all right? And notice, so, so what, what does this mean? So I, again, I talk about this in my lecture videos, but by defining a member variable called set size, whenever you're in a member function, you can refer to them just using the name of the member variable. You can also use later on, uh, if you want to, you can use this, which points to set size. You'll understand what that means a bit um, more uh, clearly when we talk about pointers and dynamic memory allocation later on. Right? But you don't need to understand that quite yet. But, but yeah, you can, you can just directly um, refer to these and, and do these, you know, just set its value to zero, like we do here. What is that doing, right? So, so like when we talked about structures, if you're inside of a member function of a class like set, setting set size to zero here has the same effect as if I'm outside of here, like for my set S, set size is a member variable of, of the, the set class. So, so I could set it to be zero like this, or I could if it was public, right? So it's not public. Right. So in this case, since it's private, uh, it won't allow you to do this, and IntelliSense will um, um, would probably complain about that uh, once it figures out. Um, that um, you know, so, so the the mean the, the message maybe isn't too meaningful here, but. Um, but anyway, so, 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 so this is going to be illegal because set size is private. But if this was like a, if we made it public, that would certainly be a, a perfectly legal thing to do. So if our member variables were public instead of private, 
um, I could actually do that, right? And I could actually have different sets, like set Q. And I could set its member variable to be five, all right? And, and these would be two different instances of a set. And they all, they, they each have their own member variable. So I'm accessing S's member variable and setting it to zero here. And I'm, I'm accessing Q's member variable and setting it to five. But I, I don't know. I mean, I, I know th when you first get around to this, so, so uh, that the, this trips up people sometimes wrapping their heads around this. So you have to understand kind of what's happening here. So it's, it's the same for a structure or a class, right? So when we're defining data members, um, um, every time you create a, a new variable of that type, they each have their own copy of that data member. So the a question was asked, um, can private members be used outside of the class so long as I'm not trying to modify it? Uh, no, so, uh, you, so you can neither assign it, uh, nor could you do something like access it to print it out, which I think was your question here, like that. So again, you know, I mean, th that, this would work if I left this as public, uh, but you know, we want these to be private for the reasons for object-oriented encapsulation, like I talked about in my videos uh, this week a little bit when we talked about classes and object-oriented programming a little bit. So um, yeah, so, so you, you wouldn't be able to access it even just to read out the value um, and output it. Um, and yeah, I encourage you, you know, so there are examples of all of this. So um, I, if, if we go and look at our examples for the um, videos this week um, in the um, uh, example subdirectory for week zero two. Um, but, but yeah, probably so both for like, if you look at structures, um, uh, we'll look down here at our main function, maybe. I'm sure I got some examples. So yeah, if, if we create like a structure, um, it, by default, as we talked a little, about, a little bit about in this video, uh, members are going to be public. So it's perfectly legal when you have a structure like house type to assign things into it um, and to get the things out, like, like I showed in this example, um, week 201 structure, right? Um, and, and the definition of the structure is, is in the same file. It's up here more at the top. <coughs> but again, by default, um, you can actually use public and private for structures as well. But by default, if you don't specify it for a structure, all these things will be public, which allows you um, to do things like, you know, set the, 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 set the member variable um, and read it back out, right? And again, like I was showing, you know, I can have multiple instances of this variable. So if I create another house, my beach type, all of its member variables, style address are different from this one. And I can set them all individually um, and get them all individually, right? But if you look in week zero two classes, uh, we've got a, a class called list type which by the way is pretty similar to kind of what you're doing with the set here. So if you understand this, you understand. Although, you know, I didn't, um, you know, maybe just so that I don't confuse people, I should maybe split into uh, header files and implementation files, but I put everything just in one file so I could compile it, you know, but, but, but yeah, but you can do the same thing in, in, in one single file. So, so we've got the declaration of the list type class here, and then we've got the, implementation of all these member functions after that. Um, but once again, uh, size and this array are both private. So as I'm sure I, I talked about in the video, if we create instances of our list type, um, you know, we can set them using, we can call public member functions like set item um, and get item, but, um, Um, but, but, um, yeah, I mean, it's illegal to try and access those private members directly. So, so yeah, if you uncomment that and try and build that, 
um, you'll get a, an error message that should make more sense after the build now. I think IntelliSense will, will catch up that, um, that it's not accessible. So that's more of the error message that you should get. So it's private within that context. So, so yeah, even reading out private things is not allowed. All right, back to our, our assignment here. Um, all right, yeah, so set size is kind of similar to the size uh, for the example that we did. And, and you also have an array of items as well. So you, it's perfectly valid to have arrays inside of things that we talked a little bit about that kind of uh, nesting of data types, user-defined data types. I could even have a structure as a member variable inside of a class or another structure. So that, that's actually one of the questions on your quiz, I think, this week, hint, hint. Um, so I have a nested structure or class, so a, a structure uh, that we use as a member item inside of another structure, if you haven't taken the quiz yet this week. Um, so yeah, I mean, in this case, so, so just to um, uh, go back to the real work here, and I think I'm almost done here, unless I start, and then, you know, we'll see if we get some questions and stuff. So now, the, the very first, like I said, real work you have to do, um, so, you, so if you get to step four, everything should be compiling and running, you'll actually be um, passing, you'll be able to uncomment um, and pass, get rid of this stuff, uh, your first four uh, unit tests. So this one and the one for get size that just expects kind of the stub value of zero um, and the one for um, uh, contains item, which just since the, the set is initially empty, I mean, should be, they, they should all be false uh, that, that it contains those items. Um, and initially you should just be stubbing out to return like this empty string and so like those will all pass, but the, 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 next, the next thing you have to do for step five is implement add item, all right? So the way that the set is supposed to work, um, as I described here, um, is that it, it's a set, a mathematical set. So if I add an item five, and if I later, later on add another item five, you shouldn't have duplicates, right? So, um, but you can, you can pass all the tests uh, in the first test of add item. You don't have to worry about the duplicates initially. So if you add item five, after that point, then you're gonna have to go back and, and correctly implement is empty, get set size, contains item, and string. Okay, and let me talk a little bit about string here. But after you add item five, it's no longer the case that the set is uh, empty, right? So instead of always returning uh, is empty, uh, you, you should be, you need to return true if it is actually empty and false if it's not, all right? And instead of returning a size of zero for, for get set size, uh, which is what I say you should return for the stub, you need to return the actual set, set size, okay? And that's the easiest one to understand because there's a member variable named set size if you just set that in your add items, so, so, uh, so initially set size gets initialized to zero. So whenever you add an item, um, you're incrementing the size of the set by one, maybe if you're not adding a duplicate, but you don't have to worry about that for this first unit test here. But, but yeah, if you just increment your, the number of items, your set size, then you can just return that in your get set size. Um, and you'd be able to pass that test. Um, and then um, for contains item, you have to do something a little more complex. You have to search your array of values. So to get this right, you have to not only change the, the, the size of the set correctly in your add items, but you have to actually add it to this uh, array of integers. All right. Um, so, and, and I think from that, I mean, I hope then that gives you the idea of what you need to actually do, at least initially, to get 
your add item to work. Okay, so add item, um, so here's the documentation for add item. So your, your implementation of the add item member function should go here. So, you know, just to tell you, basically you have to do two things initially. Later on, um, um, so, so the way I guide you through doing this is, is, is um, uh, well, um, okay. So to pass these first tests, all you have to do is increment the set size by one and then add that maybe before you increment. So initially set size is zero. So when set size is zero, that means that there's nothing uh, currently in the array of integers called set item. So you can put the item that you're trying to add, which is a five here, which will get passed in as a parameter. You can put that into index zero. So when the set size is zero, you wanna add the item that's being added to index zero. And then you wanna increment set size. So the next time you add an item, it gets added to, to index one, right? And so on. So yeah, hopefully that's enough hints and enough ideas. So the basic thing you do is just add that onto the end of the array and add item. Right, and that'll work um, for all of these tests, okay? But then the, the a set is uh, supposed to be a mathematical set, so you shouldn't have duplicates. So if I later on add item five again, where I already have item five, which is the first thing that's tested um, on the next unit test. Uh, nothing should happen, right? So, so I shouldn't end up with the set containing items 5, 9, negative 142, which is what we added here, um, and then a duplicate of 5 um, at index 4, okay? But as I've set it up here, the way you should do that is by correctly implementing um, contains item, okay? So, so for contains item, to, to implement this correctly, um, again, you should return true if, if the item is in the list and false if it's not, right? So to do that, you should search through the list. So, you know, if my list is currently of size five, uh, contains item should, should write a loop that goes from zero up to five, so zero, one, two, three, four, um, and just check, you know, it, 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 is, it, is the item at index zero uh, a five? If it is, return true because, um, uh, the, the set contains the item, um, is the item at index one. So, so basically you search through all those. If you find it, you just immediately return true. Uh, if you get through the whole loop and don't find it, that means it's not in your set. So you can, then you can then return false, right? <clears throat> and then, like I say in the assignment description, if you get the contains item working correctly, you should reuse that for your get set size. So what you'll do on get set size is you'll first check if myself contains, um, you, you'll call get items, uh, or contains items, I should say, right? So, and, and again, like, like, like um, so, so like you can refer to member variables, um, you can just also just refer to a member function directly. So inside of your contain, uh, sorry, inside of your add item, um, you can just call, Your own contains item, right? Right. So that. So yeah, you shouldn't. You shouldn't duplicate the the functionality of contains items. You can reuse contains items inside of your own add items to get the second test case to work. So it doesn't. So it handles duplicates, not putting duplicates in your set. Right. So yeah, if you call your own contains items, if if it's true that you have contains items, like I say here, and like I say in the assignment description, you don't have to do anything. So um, you can just return immediately, a, a no operation. So yeah, so you do nothing if the item is already in the set. All right. Now, um, I, I think I gave some hints on how to implement the string function. 
Um, yeah, so, so actually I'm walking through these. So, um, you know, really after you um, uncomment this, um, then you can work on individually getting the get set size to work, then the add item to work like I was just, or sorry, the, the contains item to work like I was just describing. Um, and then you want to work on getting the string, right? So what I suggest is, uh, and there's more than one way to do this, but it's probably a good idea right now to learn to use uh, what's known as a string stream object, okay? Um, and, I, and, and again, I think that I, I mean, I know I showed some examples of this um, in our videos this week. Um, so yeah, to, to use a string stream, you, you include the string stream library, right? So probably in this list type so in the video on um, about classes and maybe on the video on structure as well. So yeah, I called it two string in this example, but, but yeah, this is supposed to construct a string representation list. So basically kind of your, your um, implementation of the string for your assignment is going to look pretty similar to the example I gave um, in uh, the, the lecture videos for this week. I'm pretty certain that I used a string stream here. All right, this is one way. I mean, you can do it just by constructing a string by like using plus to add items together and using two strings, uh, the, the two string method. Uh, but I think that that's um, a lot less clean than just using a, a string stream. So if you, if you create an output string stream, this creates um, um, a, um, yeah, so I mentioned it to overload the a string function, I think. Um, yeah, I sh well, I don't know, so, so the question was, or the, it was a comment more of about, uh, that I mentioned it about to overload the string function in the class video. So we were later to talk about, we're, we're kind of implementing this two string um, and it's kind of overloading it, but we'll later on uh, next week or the week after, we're gonna talk about overloading functions and operators. So you'll see really what, what kind of overloading string access methods are. So, but yeah, if you create one of these streams, so you know, in this class, I'm, I mostly require you guys to learn using the, the stream output interface uh, in order to do input and output for things. So yeah, if you create your own stream, like a string stream, you can treat it like C out and C in that you, that you should have seen examples of um, already, quite a few examples of. So you can just output things to it, um, like the, uh, the, the value, like you can loop through your, uh, an array and output the values uh, through, uh, in your array out to it. The only thing you need to do then at the end, when you have one of these O string streams, you just call str on it. And that converts it from an O string stream to an actual string type. Because so what you want to return from your function, like we're returning from here, is a is a is an actual string, not one of these string streams. Um, but yeah, that converts it basically. All right, yeah, and then, I mean, you know, that's, um, once you get add item working, um, the, the things do get more complicated here, so, so I won't, you know, I won't lie. Uh, I mean, remove item is not too much more difficult than add item, right? So conceptually, you know, when, when we give an item to remove from the set, um, so if you look down the test, down at the test here for remove item. Um, so, you know, I mean, we, we test things like, you know, if you're, if you, if you ask to remove an item that's not in the set, you can just ignore it. So if you if you ask to remove an item, this an item, you should just ignore it. 
but if you remove items, so I think currently the, the set contains these items um, at this point for the test. So if you remove a nine, you know, you should find that the size has gone from four to three. So oh, the, the, the complication on remove item is you really need to do some shifting as des described here. So when you remove an item, um, so, so there's, I mean, there's a couple of ways you can handle that, but I'm requiring you to handle it this way. So, so you could leave the hole. So if you end up removing an item from the middle of the array, you could leave the hole and put some sort of an indicator value in there. So the next time you add an item, you might replace like a flag value. So that's one way to do it, but it's no, there's no easy way if I allow any integer to be a valid integer that can be in the set. Like you can't use negative nine or negative one or negative max integer as your indicator value because those could be valid values for the set. So, so what you need to do here is shift the items. So, so that's a little bit more complicated than the add item. Uh, you have to, to find the item and if you find the item, all the items in the array above that have to be shift down, shifted down by one uh, index. Making certain that you correctly handle, like if you end up removing the very first item in the array, that, that everything gets shifted down by one, or if you've removed the last item in the array, that you don't incorrectly go past the end of the bounds of your array and and um, mess up memory. So, but yeah, so so remove item it might be a difficult test for some people. So we'll see how people do on that one. Um, and then the last two are a union. So, so a set, mathematical sets, you can do the union of the set um, and you can do the intersection of the set. Right. So I've kind of run out of time. So, you know, you'll have to um, figure those out mostly on your own. But um, you know, the, the basic idea is that uh, there's lots of tests in here. Uh, so what happens for both the union and the intersection is if you call the, the, like the union for set one with the union of set two, it ends up modifying set one. To, the, the result after calling this is set one is gonna be whatever the union is of set one and set two. So when you do the, the union, that might make the set go bigger, right? So um, when you add, when you do the union of two sets, uh, either the, the, there might be some, some items in set two that weren't in set one. So those, those, those items will end up being in set one after you make a union between the two. And intersection uh, kind of works in the same way, but for an intersection, uh, that's more tests of union there and more tests of union. So for intersect, um, you know, it works the same way that you're supposed to do for this class, but uh, you know, so you do, you call the, the member function on one of the sets and you pass it on another set. Um, but in this case, you know, you're going to be doing the intersection. So the intersection could cause the set to, to, to shrink. So um, if all the items in set one are in set two, then, then nothing will happen to set one. But if, if set two doesn't have some of the items that are in set one, those items need to end up being removed from set one. So. All right. So yeah, I'm, I'm going to have to wrap up this video here because I got to move to the next class. Any last questions here before I kind of uh, stop it? All right, yeah, with that, I'm gonna have to kind of uh, run here. So uh, hopefully that was useful. Um, and we're gonna go ahead and end the session and yeah, some questions by email if you need them, if you need to. Uh, otherwise, I got, I'll see you guys next uh, Monday then.